Everybody, this is Ray Renati, and you have reached Green Room on Air, and this is my podcast. How's it going, everybody? I really hope you're all doing well. It's been a rough week. We had that State of the Union address, and now we got the coronavirus. What else do we have? We got all kinds of crazy stuff happening in the world. But you know what? We keep on trucking. And today, I have a very special guest for you, Sarah Moore. Sarah Moore is a clown. My first clown conversation. Who'd have thunk? Sarah Moore is a clown's clown, if you will. She has been clowning for decades. She was dubbed uh, by Merv Griffin. Do you remember Merv Griffin? The maker of uh, Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune and used to have his own talk show. Well, he called Sarah Moore the hardest working clown in show business and our new Fanny Bryce. She's worked with all kinds of big stars. She's worked with Ringling Brothers and Barnum Bailey Circus. She's also a writer, a director, and a filmmaker. And she has a new show, a new show that will debut on February 19th at Z Space in San Francisco, February 19th through the 29th. It's directed by my friend, Colin Johnson, who I've worked with many times. He's a fantastic director. She was so happy to get Colin as her director, and you'll hear that in our chat. I don't see how this show can be anything but mesmerizing. So get your tickets. Go to uh, zspace.org forward slash supers. zspace.org forward slash supers. Okay, I think that's enough of the housekeeping portion of our show. Let's get right into my talk with Sarah Moore. Thanks for coming on the show. Well, my pleasure. I've been uh, watching some of your videos and laughing this morning. You're quite funny. Well, thanks. I, I hope so at this point in my career. Do you consider yourself mostly a clown? Yeah, I mean, because to me, the word clown is sort of an all-encompassing word. And, you know, I get I get kind of philosophical about it, too, because I think clown in many ways is sort of the foundation of acting because it's the most sort of uninhibited and jazz-like part of your nature as an actor. So, you know, when I was a kid, I started out as a, as a musical theater actor. And then I sort of found my way into amusement park clowning and then circus clowning because it was a way to not only make a living, but it was a way to be like as wildly expressive as I wanted to be. So, yeah, I've been doing it a while. Amusement parks clowning and circus clowning. That sounds like yeah. a lot of fun. Um, yeah. What kind of circuses did you perform in? I've been in a number of them. I, I mean, I, I was uh, in Ringling Brothers for a while. I worked at a place called Circus World in Florida, which was a tributary of Ringling Brothers and also became its own entity. I've been on the New Pickle Circus. I've been on Make a Circus locally here in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. I've been a uh, featured clown with Circus Bella, which is really the sort of premier one ring circus of the Bay Area of Northern California. So I'm really most proud, I think, of Circus Bella. That's the job that I hope to have, you know, as I continue to travel these roads. So yeah, and I'm, and now, of course, I'm at Circus Center. I've been there on and off for 20 years. I was artistic director of Maker Circus for a while. And now, you know, now I'm running the Clown Conservatory, which is a kind of a who knew kind of moment for me. Oh, I, you're running the Clown Conservatory in San Francisco. Yeah, it's a good, it's a, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful gig because not only are you immersed in the world of clown, but you're also, you know, you're training the next generation of, mm -hmm. of complete idiots. And I think more than anything, we need them now with all the divisions in our country. We need people that can, you know, make fun of all of us and keep the levity in the air. Is it too late for me to join? I am a complete idiot. I'm kind of well, old, Well, you are though. most welcome. Okay. We're actually recruiting right now for the next Clown Conservatory class, which will be the 2021 graduating class. So we are actively taking applications right now for 
the next clown con. So come on, Ray, you should. Okay, me. I'm actually going to look <laughs> into it. I'm serious. This is great. Um, I love it. Colin teaches on the program to Colin Johnson, who is yeah. our director um, yeah. of film, and he's also um, our show director for Clown Conservatory. Ah. He's just a really talented uh, guy, and he's sort of my my right hand at Clown Conservatory. So you have a new show coming up at Z Space. Supers. The Supers is, a, is an idea that was born about 18 years ago uh, after 9-11 happened. And it was, you know, such a horribly devastating moment in our country. And I was trying to figure out a way to create a story of hope and redemption after that tragedy. And now, of course, the further tragedies of our immigration crisis and uh, all of this has also fueled, fueled the, the story and the tone of this piece. So what it is is a, a story of sort of cosmic refugees that are on their way here trying to find some peace of mind. And, of course, they're up against what our actual immigrants are up against right now, which is a lot of authoritarian forces and cruelty. And so the Supers is a pantomime opera, really, a, or what I call a clown opera, about finding the people who are helping, as Fred Rogers so famously said. You know, it's really about... You know, finding the kindness and the sort of everyday superpowers that each of us have to make a difference in someone else's life. So that's what that's what it's about. And it's all done in very high relief. It's like it's, it's a living cartoon. And the score, I mean, I'm really excited about this, Ray, because the score is written by Rob Reich, who is one of the Bay Area's most kind of wildly talented composer musicians. And I met him when I was on Circus Bella last year. And he, he's the composer and the music director for Circus, the Circus Bella All-Star Band, which is just a band of insanely talented musicians. So I'm really lucky to have this combination of Rob Reich and then the very gifted Colin Johnson, who is really a rising star, I think, as a, an American director and writer. I mean, he's just really talented. Of yeah. course, he did my last show with me, Atomic Clown. And then the cast alone, we have Maureen McVeary, starring in the show, who is kind of a stalwart of Bay Area musical theater and theater in general. And the rest of the cast is really pretty well-rounded. We have Kayla Mae Paz Suarez, who plays Oopsie uh, in the show, is a wonderful, delightful little character. She's also a, a sort of a rising star in Bay Area theater. And then you've got Di Marcello Funes, who came out of the Prescott Circus Theater, and Circus Bella, and he's very uh, kind of an amazingly gifted clown. And then you've got Joel Baker, um, who is a star of Cirque du Soleil. Um, he was on the, the show Love in Las Vegas for many years as Paul McCartney. So he's a really great clown. And he also, some of these folks are not only graduates of Clown Conservatory, but they're teachers in, in the Clown Conservatory. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty gifted. You've got a lot everybody? of talent there. I know. I mean, it's, wow. it's, 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 it's pretty, it's pretty wild. Gia Milhau is the other, is the other person I wanted to mention too. He's mm -hmm. also one of the, uh, the immigrant characters. He graduated from Clown Conservatory and studied in Paris with, um, Django Edwards, uh, the famous American ex expat who's over there teaching clowning. And then Adam Roy. Adam Roy is kind of the star of the show and Adam, uh, plays the sort of the, the the range of authoritarian characters that are up against these people, and in my opinion, he's doing some Jedi level clowning. I mean, they all are, but but Adam is doing like Obi Wan Kenobi level clowning. So um, <laughs> just super like super high end, really good physical theater. So you will feel really immersed when you come into this show. It's it's a very trance like kind of situation, or what I call you know a a, a dreamscape, a clownscape. And it's for audiences of all ages. I mean, I, I really think three-year-olds could get into this, and 93-year-olds could get into this. So, um, I love so there you go, Ray. I, as you can tell, I can talk about it forever. So just interrupt uh, me. It's great. No, no, I don't want to interrupt you. I'll, I'll let you talk. <laughs> if I interrupt too much, then i got to edit out all my, my uh, uh-huh, mm-hmm, yeah, uh -huh. oh, It gotcha. gets kind of okay. tedious. So I've learned not to do that over it's the last hard. few years. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. But I love doing this. I love talking to people in the Bay Area. Mostly that's who I talk to, people like you. Awesome. you know, Maureen's actually a good friend of mine. Uh, oh, uh, wonderful. Yeah, she's so oh. funny, too. Oh, man. I love Maureen. It's like working with Carol Burnett. It's like totally. working with Or Imogene Coca, you know, only, you know, she, she's just so, 
she's the whole package. I mean, she's a really solid, incredible actor. She, she, when I brought her onto this project, she said, well, I don't know. I've, I've never really done any clowning. And I'm like, oh, I'm my like, God. Give me a break. <laughs> you are a clown. She's always clowning. <laughs> yeah. And see, and my example, see, my example of great clowns are people like Imogene Coca, Carol Burnett, Lucille Ball, Mr. Bean, Pee Wee Herman. These yeah. are clowns. And they, yeah. as you notice, none of them has a fright wig and a red nose on. So, yes, I was reading about that on your bio. You were talking about the... Uh, how clowns have become scary figures over the years, and it your your thought I think was that it had to do with sort of the red wig and the and the nose and the aggressive well, it, maleness of it all. Some of that. I mean, I yeah. remember I wrote this this essay a couple of years ago called "The State of the Clown," and it was very philosophical, and it did touch on that because two years ago was sort of the beginning, really, of the Me Too movement, and so you know, it just seems to have this broad. Reach the Me Too movement, um, and it's really just all about people behaving badly, and in particular men. And it's like if we can get to a place where we can just have this kind of behavior abate, you know, and not and and not engage in it anymore, and think of ourselves with more equality, you know. And I'm of course talking about genders, but I'm also talking about all kinds of orientations. I mean, part of the basic tenet, one of the basic tenets of the supers is that there is no supremacy. There's no supremacy. That's an, an idiotic concept. And, you know, we've been up against it uh, in this country. There's this idea of who's more important and who's allowed to have respect and who isn't. And so I think yeah. it's all wrapped up in this kind of thing. When you dress someone garishly and there's a measure of aggression going on, yeah, that's scary. You know, but I've seen that with women too. <laughs> I've seen that with, with everybody. I've seen that with, you know, there's some little kids that are really scary when they're dressed up and coming at you. So I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like for me, you know, the, there's that conversation, you know, that's very deep, the, phil the philosophies of humanity and supremacy and maleness and femaleness and how we perceive each other, right? But yeah. the other conversation that I'm really interested in is where American clowning in particular is going. Because I, I, mean, I love all the clowns. I, I don't care if you're a birthday party clown or your old school Clowns of America clown, or you're into hospital clowning, or relief clowning, whatever it is, the whole basic idea of it is to create joy, to create joy, and to get people to, to be on a level playing field with how silly we all are. That absolutely everybody on this planet is a human being, or an animal of one kind or another. Can we have some mutual respect for each other? Can we make that the starting place? And the study and practice of clowning really, really helps with that. It's about, right. again, the people that are helping. I really agree with that. If if we could get to the point where we saw each other as equals and were able to laugh at ourselves and just have fun more, the world would be right. a much better place. Well, and easier, just easier. It's so much easier yeah. to love people than it is to be a hateful idiot. And the thing is, you know, the very idea that Rush Limbaugh could be given the, the Medal of Freedom is such an incredible, oh devastating, disgusting thing to do. But as someone who actually did work for Donald Trump for a while, I can tell you, because I worked in the casinos of Atlantic City, I'm not in the least bit surprised at all that this, this would be, you know, a creature to creature kind of, here's, here's, here's your commendation from one complete pile of crap to another. <laughs> I, I absolutely so, couldn't believe it when I saw him sitting up there uh, next to Melania. Uh, well, I couldn't, then, uh, after that, I couldn't watch right it there. anymore. I, I just turned it off. I still have it recorded over on my DVD, but, uh, my, my uh, direct TV thing, but I'm, I don't want to watch it. Yeah. I mean, I, and I don't, I, I, I want to be kind to all people. I really do, right? But at this point in our, in our country's evolution, I'm, I don't, I, you're, I'm deleting you. <laughs> Just go away. If you're going to be hateful and toxic. But that also said, I want to figure out ways as clowns that we can reach across these divides. I don't know how to do it yet because today, the day after all this happened, I'm still pretty angry. And I think yeah. that's a normal human thing to be angry at people who are cruel. I think cruelty and the propagation of cruelty, that's almost not forgivable. You know, that's, that's, that's ba almost banishment. But having said that, the thing that I'm trying to figure out in, in the world of clown is, again, how to get from that place to a place, as Rumi said, in, in, in this field between right and wrong. 
If we can get to that place, even with the Rush Limbaugh's, even with the Trumps, if we can get there somehow, maybe we have a shot at turning things around. Well, what I have a challenge with, and, and I can't get my my head around this, is the the diehard followers of Trump and how it's literally impossible to have a conversation with them. I know. I've, I have people like that in my family, and I don't know Me what too. to do. I don't know what to do about it. I want to talk. I, I I want to understand, but it's impossible. They get emotional. They get angry. Then they start saying right. new things. Then they start deflecting, and it's it's always the same with all of them. And I don't know what's going on. I, are they indoctrinated by Fox News, Fox News and Rush Limbaugh and these people? How do we bridge that gap? And I think it's great that you're you're doing your part to do that. Oh, right. I think humor and and pathos and storytelling and and music perhaps are the way to do it to get the people's hearts instead of and getting them out of their heads and their anger and their divisiveness and and their jealousy and their. I, I think these people are at the core of it. I think they're afraid of something, and, and this is the I way know. that they're acting. Yeah. You're absolutely and, right. And they're That's identifying right. with the bully. They're identifying with the strong man because they're afraid of him. And I think even the senators are doing that. I think so, too. I mean, it's really, you know, I do. I have those people in my family, too. And it's kind of stunning to me that, like, it just feels like some kind of, well, it feels warped. I, I was going to say it feels like an easy way out, but I don't think it's easy for them. I think that they're in a state of writhing anxiety all the time because they're you're right they're afraid of something mm -hmm. and it i it, it's baffling and the thing about the clown again going back to the the whole concept of the clown is that we are basically fearless fools you know i mean i the clown will will go almost anywhere to to extend you know i would i would i would say an olive branch but i think it's more of a pie <laughs> <laughs> like, my, a pie in the face. My pie here. <laughs> and, and our idea of violence, of, of getting yeah. back at somebody, is pieing them, you know, or, or shoving, them, shoving them down a very padded staircase, you know? It's like, yes. I mean, what's great about physical comedy is it's sort of really great physical comedy is, is the embodiment, the very embodiment of being a clumsy human. Because all of us are clumsy. You know, even yeah. the people that we think have the most grace, they don't. They're still human. They still fall down and drool and spit and cough and sneeze and everything else. So snore. I mean, yeah, right. And this is the thing I love about the embracing of clowning is it's got this almost zen feel to it. It's like don't resist, don't resist being who you are. Right. And and the thing about the the people that that support fascism, because that's what it is. It's just fascism. The people that support this, it's it's almost like they're rejecting their own humanity. They're rejecting. They, they're looking for something that's going to save them from having to face the fact that they are who they are. Yeah. And, you know, and that means that you have to chuck out the idea of supremacy. You have to get rid of it. You are not better than somebody else, and somebody else is not better than you. And if we can get to that, that beautiful field between right and wrong, there's something there. And I, what I hope for the supers, Ray, what I really hope for it is that the show will do what it's being created to do, which is to bring people together and make us, make audiences just leave feeling like, you know, I can look at another person that on any other normal day, maybe I wouldn't understand or I wouldn't like or I would immediately say that person's too different than me for me to understand and take a step toward them. You know, take a step toward them. Now, now I'm assuming, maybe I'm wrong, but most of the people who will be going to your show are already of your mindset. Well, um, that's the issue. Just like the jungle, when the jungle played ACT, you know, it was a fantastic show, but all of us in the Bay Area were well on board with understanding the plight or wanting to understand the plight of these people over in, in France and what they had gone through and what they're still going through. But, but the, the idea of the jungle is they wanted to take that show into other, in other communities around the country that would normally be very red state, very right wing communities and try to get them to see the show about the plight of real people, what they're going through when they're displaced and when they're refugees, because there's a real dismissive quality to a lot of, of the, the right wing people in this country about what other people go through. Do you think you, you know, might be think, doing that with the supers? That's what I hope to do. I hope that, and like you just said, with heart, 
this is a show that is, there's no dialogue. Everything, every aspect of this story is told with face and body and music. But the whole tone of it, the whole story of it is, is, is really being able to look at each other and accept that there's people that are different than you that actually can become your family. They could become a, a vital part of your own life. And by joining together, by collaborating together, that's how we make good things happen. That's, you know, that's, that's how we move forward. No one is alone. No one is ever alone. You know, if you elect to be an isolated person, that's a different thing. But even then, like, you know, you're, the world around you is, is populated. The, the, the whole point of the supers is that love is the last great technology. And that is the, the tagline to the show. And that's a very broad and interesting term, but for me, like what that basically means is you know, we've mastered so many other things. We've been able to figure so many things out. What we haven't been able to figure out is how to actually love each other, you know, even with all of our faults, even with our differences. Well, you know, even uh, probably the people going to your show will will be more uh, on the on the left, if you will. I don't like using that. Sure. Term, but, and I think that, including myself, I could use a little bit more uh, instruction on love because I get so frustrated that I can get angry. And uh, that doesn't help either. I mean, if you get no. angry directly at people who you feel <clears throat> are blinded, uh, it's not going to make them see. It's going to take something different than that. You need to figure out how to love everyone no matter what their beliefs are and it's the hard. part of it is getting them to love you back you know it's yeah. like i mean trying to get family members who you know there's a there's sort of a a foundational love within families okay we're family yeah. right right but at the same time like getting them to really actively love you even though they're they're of an entirely different mindset and they're and they're they themselves are behaving in a cruel way if, if there's a way to draw them into a world of your love and get them to see that, like, you actually are being kind and that that kindness is something they should cherish. That's another thing about the supers that we play with between these characters, that we're trying to portray different types of repulsion and kindness and how we get to each other, you know, and then how we join forces to create a greater kindness beyond ourselves. So one of the things that I've found uh, with trying to, and this is new to me, uh, relates to family members and friends who uh, believe in the current uh, presidential regime, <laughs> uh, is even though we stop talking about it because it brings up conflict, there's always an elephant in the room. There's always this thing that we know, yeah. is, uh, and I, I, I wonder if your show deals with that at all, or if you've thought about how to deal with that as uh, from the perspective of what you do. I mean, yes, I have, but I've, I've kind of tackled it by way of the fairy tale, because you know, again, like I put slapped so many labels on what the supers is, and I almost feel like, you know, it's science fiction, magical realism, human cartoon opera, right? But it's also you know, what I wanted to do was create a fairy tale in the same way that Harry Nielsen created a fairy tale when he wrote The Point. And, you know, when I was a child, The Point was the biggest thing that I remember. You know, it's the biggest cultural moment of my childhood. I worshipped it. I still do. I think it's one of the greatest things. And it's a wonderful album. The music is just wonderful. But, you know, the idea of a, a little boy being born into the land of Point without a point and so they send him off into the pointless forest with his dog. And they find out that the paradox of life is that everything and everyone has a point. And that, that no one has a point. <laughs> Nothing has a point, too. Yeah. So I'm kind of in that realm. I'm in that realm with the supers. I'm creating an emotional landscape. You know, an emotional sort of trance-like quality to the piece. Where people can come in and feel these emotions. And be able to experience loss and hunger and longing for it for for collaboration and kindness and being banished and being afraid and finding through all these emotions how to come together how to answer a call your own call to action and find out what your superpowers are because there's usually more than one and they change throughout our lives and then how to activate those powers to help someone else to do something for someone else because the hardest thing about this you know 
really fascistic right wing agenda these days, um, and also all through time, it's how selfish it is. You know, it's like, bugger you, Jack. I've got mine. I don't care. What's fascinating to me are, are some of the, the the sheeple. You know, the people that follow these regimes that they seem to be deluded. They seem to think these leaders care about them. That's amazing to me. And what they're preaching is rank selfishness. They're pre- mm-hmm. they're, they're preaching don't care about other people. Don't give a crap about anyone but yourself. And meanwhile, again, like that is another form of like supremacy. And we need to get rid of this concept of supremacy. So I don't know. I, you know what, Ray? The funny thing is I should have been a philosophy major. And I almost was. I almost wanted to go to college for philosophy. But instead I became a clown. So now I'm just like... <laughs> I'm constantly running my mouth about things I experience and see, and, and yet I'm not an intellectual by any stretch. You know, I'm very much a theater artist and a circus artist, but I'm really trying to use these skills to, to you know, just to inspire people. You know, I want people to be inspired to be decent and loving to each other and realize that humor and music and poetry and culture in general is soul food, and we need this. And if we have more of it, you know, maybe people would, they would just be in a different soulful zone within themselves and they wouldn't be so quick to say, that's over there. I want that. That needs to not exist. And that person over there is wrong. Instead of being so angry all the time. Well, you, you know, brought up Mr. Rogers and um, I, I think that's a good example of of that sort of antidote to this problem. Yeah. You know, he made a lifetime uh, of trying to solve it through storytelling and kindness and he did he was sort of a clown guy. in a way many times uh yeah, all his his show and, yeah magical magical it was. yeah you know so that's the thing is you know as artists and you know this too ray as a theater artist like a, a, part, a big part of our job is to figure out how to just enlighten and inspire people and then be enlightened and inspired back by them to create the next thing we need art more than ever, you know? Absolutely. Now, I like the fact that you're doing this as pantomime. Um, yeah. When I was over in England, pantomime was very is very popular in England and London, especially, and we don't get a lot of that here, but I think that it can touch you in a different way that, uh, than words can. Um, well, I discovered that a few years ago when I did a show called Wonder World. I wrote a version of Alice in Wonderland where all of the characters were now over the age of 70. And it was kind of inspired by my, my mom because I'm the proud daughter of a British mother. And so I grew up, you know, in a household of, of masterpiece theater and shepherd's pie and all that stuff. But there was a sensibility about the household. There was a comic sensibility of like, no matter what, we carry on. You know, you, you look at the British women like, you know, uh, Dame Judi Dench and Maggie Smith. I mean, they're as old as the hills and they're still working, which is great. So I wanted to write a piece about aging as a homage to my mother, and it turned into this pantomime, right? It became the whole thing was done, again, all pantomime, no words at all, and all set to music. So that show ran uh, for a while at the Creativity Theater in the summer of 2013 and then moved the following year uh, to Center Rep out in um in Walnut Creek and did really well, you know, would, would, did really well in both venues. And it inspired me to want to do bigger shows. It made me realize I want to do this, this silent, but, but, you know, musicalized form of entertainment, but I want to do it on the size of grand opera. I want to write these big physical comedy operas. And I call it opera because I love opera. And I was raised going to the Academy of Music in Philadelphia to see operas. And, and, and I, I love the, the grandiosity of it. I love how huge everything is, all the emotions. And that, to me, is very akin, that's very similar to clowning, you know? Yeah. Um, drag, drag performers are very similar. Drag, drag performance and clown performance are very much two sides of the same coin. But I think it's a three-sided coin because the other side of the coin is high opera. <laughs> so <laughs> it's all about, you know, being amplified, the amplified human spirit. And these art forms, whether it's opera or, or clowning or drag, all afford that. They, they, they allow you to do it. And even Shakespeare, I mean, some of his most interesting characters are the clowns. Well, I love them. I mean, I, I got to play Bottom uh, in an off-Broadway production of Midsummer 
gosh, back in, what was it, 2006 or seven? Yeah, that was a golden moment for me. I always wanted to play him, and I got to. But yeah, Shakespeare's clowns are over the top, too. Such um, a great role, Bottom. Such a great role. Oh, he's wonderful. You must have loved that. <laughs> it's written so yeah. well. I mean, he is a total clown. He may be the best clown in all of Shakespeare. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's lovely, you know, mm -hmm. and um, stupid and, and fabulous. And, and yeah, yeah, he is very well written. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> he gets to die, you know, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I was a Thisbe once. Uh, oh, wonderful. So, uh, uh, gosh, about 10, 15 years ago. So I got to, to kill Bottom. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like 200 pounds, six feet tall. It was kind of ridiculous. But, um, and our bottom was about Jimmy Gunn. I don't know if you know him. He he was a comedian here in the Bay Area. He passed away a few years ago. But he's only he was only like five four. So that was that was that was a blast. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. speaking of of Bay Area comedians, I I kind of wanted to say this too that the reason I'm here is because of Joan Mankin. Ah. Um, Twenty years ago, I auditioned for Make a Circus. And at the time, I was living in Minneapolis because I was there making a film, and I kind of had a pretty good life in the Midwest. I, I moved out there because I just loved uh, Minneapolis. It's a wonderful, wonderful city and great theater there. I ended up making a feature film, and then I was like, hmm, okay, I'm kind of done with this chapter. Where do I go next? And Joan Mankin hired me, you know, to, to be a clown in the circus, and it kind of I'd, I'd been away from clowning for a while. And she brought me back to it, and um, it changed my life. And then I met, of course, Peggy Ford and Paoli Lacey and Letitia Bartlett and, you know, all these amazing people who had been circus and mime troupe people. Yeah. And they um, they kind of, and they're all, many of them are gone now. They're all gone. Except for Letitia, thank God, she's here. That contingency, I will always be grateful to everything they did because they were like, yes, this is a place you can come and actually be a clown, really live the life of a clown. So San Francisco is still a haven for that. We're still the clown capital of the country. Um, we all miss so that, Joan. Yeah, I, I, oh, thinking about Joan, everyone loved her. She was such a wonderful person. Yeah. She really was as gifted as hell. Like I'm an amazing actor. And, yeah. And she was in Wonder World with me. I mean, we were clown partners in the last part of her life so so that was what propelled this you know i mean i've done all different kinds of clown theater whether it was showho which was my crazy one woman show that i did recently a few months ago i just did atomic clown which was a show that was based on all the stuff that happened to me all at once <laughs> so it was kind of this terrible you know amalgam of of life forces that but you know i found the funny in it and i still do i still think you know, like I agree with Mel Brooks, you know, tragedy, tragedy plus time is comedy. And, you know, World War Two, hysterically funny. You know, it's like the worst, the worst it could be, the funnier it could be, too. But, yeah, I think the Supers is, is for everyone. And what I would hope is that it can be born here, travel. You know, I'd like to take it all over the place if I can. I want to I want to create a curriculum around it so it can go into the schools so kids can learn about the fact that everybody is a super. Everybody has the capacity to be a helper and change somebody's day, change somebody's life. Well, that's a great idea. Um, but I really want to do that. I want to have supers clubs all over the country, all over the world. So when I croak, that'll be my legacy. Is, you know, I, I really want to leave, leave the world with a little hope because it's crazy to, to think that, like, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and it's like <laughs> I, I would never have dreamed that our country would go this far. Uh, to the right and so far uh, into oh, a, me a, either I feel a, like a I'm living in some I feel like I'm living in some sort of parallel universe I I, I never imagined this okay like no and and when I was a kid I, I I was riveted to the TV watching the Nixon stuff but oh, that was different wow. in, in many ways this has gone to another level I think uh, yeah it really has and I think everybody's kind of I was talking to my sister in New York this morning. We were all we were talking about everybody, everybody with a decent heart, kind, a kind disposition is is sad today, you know. Yeah. And well, uh, that's why we need people like you. We need people like you to change that to ch to spread a different. Uh, oh, thanks, Ray. I message so. around I really, the country. Well, yeah. I just want to do my 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 part, and I and my 
I, I love bringing people together. I like a party. I like everyone to come together and chill out and laugh and, and, you know, cry when you need to, but laugh as much as you can because, mm-hmm. you know, that's the I world. The world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think that, I think, gosh, I think I've said everything. I've said a lot. Do you think I've said too much? <laughs> no, you're wonderful. I, I, oh, I love it. Thank you. <laughs> I, well, and your show is so called The Supers. The Supers. And Open it's going to be Z Space. Z Space, Z Space, right? Yep, Z Space in the Mission. Um, it used to be Theater Arco, um, mm-hmm. but it's now called Z Space, and it's wonderful. Uh, the great Lisa Steindler is the artistic director there. It's my favorite theater space in the whole city, so I'm really glad that we got it. But it's going to run only nine performances, and this is a family show. This is a show to bring everybody to. You can bring your kids, bring grandma, bring grandpa, everybody. So that's what I'm hoping. I want to I want to hear lots of little kids laughing. <laughs> that would be wonderful. So uh, Z Space uh, in San Francisco from February 19th through the 29th. All they have, all people have to do is go to the Z Space website. You can just Google yep, Z Space and there it is. Yep, there's a big page devoted to the supers. Yeah, there's also t- going to be tickets on Gold Star. I'm pretty sure there's a kid ticket price. To- I'll put the links in the in the show notes so people will be able to just uh, click on them. That's great. That's perfect, yeah. Ray. Thank you. Well, yeah. yeah. Tell everybody to get on in here. It's going to be lovely. I mean, it's really going to be a fun run. And we, the joy that's gone into creating this show, Colin and I were saying, like, we looked at each other and said, don't you have that feeling, that rare feeling? And I said, yeah, I've got it. I've got that feeling, you know, that this is a really special piece of theater. And uh, it feels like Forrest Gump in this way that, like, Forrest Gump was in turnaround for something like 15 years before all the elements came together and the film was to be what it was to be. You know, Tom Hanks had to come of age and, uh, you know, all the other players and the director, like everybody had to be in the right place at the right time to make the right movie. And that's the same with the Supers. Like everybody that's involved is absolutely meant to be there. And mm. it, that's a rare feeling. So, so everyone, yeah. everyone has to come see this. <laughs> I've had that a couple of times. So I know what you're talking about, and it's uh, yeah. it's it's wonderful. It's surreal. It's otherworldly. So I really can't wait to see this show. I can't wait to, and I can't wait to meet you. you know? I know. I can't believe I, mean, I haven't met you, unless I have. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we'll <laughs> we'll find out when we see each other. <laughs> yeah, that's what Colin said. He's like, "What do you mean you don't know Ray?" And I'm like, "Oh, well." <laughs> I know of him, and he's like, "Oh, you guys totally know each other." So, um, <laughs> Colin and I had a lot of fun with this thing called Shots. I don't know if you would know. What I shots know. Is. Yeah. yeah, Shots is great. Shots oh, is I great. have so much fun doing that. <laughs> well, uh, um, thanks, Sarah. It's been great talking. Oh my god! To you. I, yeah. It's great talking to you, Ray. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed that conversation with Sarah Moore. Not only is she a great performer, but as you heard, she is a thoughtful and concerned human being, and I love that. I thought before we uh, signed off, I'd play a little clip from the, uh, the cult classic film that she wrote and directed called Homo Heights, starring the late, great Quentin Crisp. Check it out. So what did you do tonight besides your usual autoerotic endeavors? Don't be cheeky. I yacked a bit with that Tootsie chap from the Homo Herald. That mealy mouth hack. What did you talk to him about? Oh, everything. Benoit balls, radiator caps, gelatin versus pudding, alien kidnappings, my rage, my desperation. Oh, fuck me, Malcolm. What is it now? What could you want? A surprise, or to die. They could be one and the same thing. Cut the King Lear, Malcolm. You're so dramatic. Dramatic? Look at me. I'm the Greta Garbo of queerdom. You are off limits, Cookie. Incommunicado. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Green Room on Air. I really enjoyed speaking with Sarah. I feel so privileged that I'm able to have these conversations with performers who have achieved so much in their fields. They have so much to share, and 
they are always so thoughtful and intelligent and funny. And uh, Sarah is no exception. And don't forget about her show, so be sure to go to the website ZSpace in San Francisco, and you can get your tickets there for the Supers. I will put a link in the show notes here for this episode. The Supers runs from February 19th to the 29th. If you would like to contact me or talk to me about being a guest on the show, just send an email to greenroomonair at gmail.com, and I'd be happy to talk to you. Or if you have any questions or comments about this episode or any other episodes or suggestions for future episodes. And remember, Green Room On Air can be found on all of your major podcasting platforms. The website address is raisegreenroom.com. All the episodes are there as well. If you have your own podcast and you want to mention mine, go for it, and I'd be happy to mention yours. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please tell your friends all about it. The more listeners, the better. The more listeners I have, the more interesting content I can create. Again, thank you so much for listening. I think we'll close out the show with my good friend, Carly Ozard singing her rendition of Imagine by John Lennon. Have a wonderful day, everyone. And until next time, I will see you on the boards. Imagine there. 